Very good afternoon, everyone. So, why do people worry about the future? Um, well, I guess the simple answer is that the world can be a very worrying place, can't it? Uh, but of course, there's much more to it than just that. And, and so this afternoon, we'll delve a little deeper into this subject of, of worry and investigate together, really, what the Bible has to say about it and the incredible relevance that the Bible still has for helping us deal with worry today. And so then you're fortunate to have me, an expert in worry, to talk to you about this subject. Uh, that's right, I'm not a psychologist, but if you ask anyone in my family, probably particularly Karen, uh, they'll tell you that I'm one of the foremost worriers in the whole world. Uh, so don't be deceived by this calm exterior. Um, but in all seriousness now, I'm not alone in worrying about the future, am I? In fact, I'm sure all of us in this room no doubt worry to a greater or lesser extent. Everyone in Ormskirk, in Britain, in the whole world in fact, has their own troubles, their own stresses, their own anxieties about the future. So I'd like us to start off with by having a think about just why people do worry about the future. Well, I guess some people worry a lot about work, don't they? Um, probably have to include myself in this category at times. Some people have very challenging uh, or stressful jobs and have to worry about tight deadlines or heavy workloads or difficult clients or colleagues. Some people seem to thrive on this pressure, uh, but the rest of us have to spend sleepless nights worrying about what the future might hold. And so, thinking further about employment then, people worry about their finances too, don't they? Some people have difficulty making ends meet. Um, they worry about being able to provide for themselves and for their family. This could stem from the worry caused by insufficient pay, maybe poor job security, debt, or a whole multitude of other reasons. And then on the other end of the scale, there are those who do have wealth and a great many possessions, but they too worry. They have to live with the side effect that one day that wealth might not be there anymore. They have to worry about losing it all through circumstances that they can't control. Others have illness or disability or disease to worry about, don't they? Maybe their own physical health or their own mental health, or maybe the health of their loved ones. Sadly, another prominent cause of worry in our modern world is terrorism, isn't it? Only recently we've heard of the terrible atrocities that have been committed in countries like New Zealand and Sri Lanka and America, all with the aim of striking terror into the hearts of ordinary innocent people. And that's touched us closer to home too, hasn't it? First of all, in Paris, uh, and then in Manchester. Unthinkably, unimaginably close, really. Terrorism has a powerful effect. Now, I grew up in Manchester, and I was studying at the University of Manchester at the time of those, those attacks, two years ago, uh, this week, in fact. Uh, I, in fact, had an exam the day before, near where, where it happened, and the CCTV that was released on the news the following day showed the movements of the person who did this. It showed him in the train station that I used every day. It showed him walking the route that I took to my lectures every day. It showed him walking through my university campus, in fact, uh, and then with all this on my mind, I had to go in for another exam the very next day. And if that doesn't cause worry and fear, I don't know what does. And so terrorism has a profound effect on ordinary people. It makes you question things that you'd never questioned before. And it's become a leading cause of worry in the world. Another source of worry then, particularly at the moment, politics. Uh, we can worry about the current government or the next government or what decisions might be made next. Um, you don't need to tell me, you don't need me to tell you, sorry about the chaos surrounding Brexit and the new government that might come in soon in, in this country at the moment, where it affects the whole world, world too, doesn't it? Many have to worry about how this will affect us, ordinary people. 
And then there's climate change, isn't there? The very future of our world. The earth is being destroyed at an alarming rate and people are seriously worried about the consequences, seriously, seriously worried uh, about what might happen in our lifetimes and also in the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. Now, that's by no means a comprehensive list. I think we'd be here all day if we listed every worry that everyone could go through. But we can clearly see from it that the world is a place full of fear. It's a place full of worry. The problems that face the world seem to be insurmountable, don't they? No wonder people worry about the future. And so, taking a step back now then, what does this all boil down to? What is the link between all of these different disparate worries? In a nutshell, I suppose I'm asking, why do we worry about the future? Well, I think it all comes down to control. Uh, control is the key factor, I believe. So on the, on the one hand, we've got the fact that we all like to always be in control of what happens in our lives. And then that comes up against what's on the other hand, the fact that we can never have full control over the future. Full control of the future isn't actually possible. The fact that the future is unpredictable and uncertain and there's nothing that we can do to stop that for many people, myself included, is quite a scary thought really. And so all of those things that we mentioned had that one thing in common, didn't they? Illness, stress, terrorism, climate change, these are all things that happen outside of our own individual control. That there's every chance that what we want to happen might not well align with what the future holds for us. And, and the fact that we have no power to stop these things happening to us can be an overwhelmingly worrying thought if we let it be. And so as much as we'd like the opposite to be true, uh, unfortunately no one can fully free us from worry because no one has complete control over the future. No one has the power to overcome unpredictability. Not scientists, not the police, not doctors, not the rich or the famous, not even world governments. Nobody out there in the world can make this problem go away completely. Nothing, it seems, can fully alleviate worry. And then unfortunately, it seems that despite everyone's best efforts, worry isn't actually getting better. It's on, it's on the increase, it's getting worse. And recent surveys have reported the highest ever levels of stress, worry, sadness and anger. And as well as this, diagnoses of mental health issues continue to rise. Innovations in science, technology, communications, these have all sought to make the world a better place. But at the same time, this has had the unintended side effect of making our world more complex, more uncontrollable. It's brought about more opportunity for things to go wrong. In short, there's more to worry about. So now that we've set the scene about worry uh, in our world, the world in which we live, let's turn to our Bibles and find out what it has to say uh, about this subject. We've con come to the conclusion, haven't we, that worry comes about because of the lack of control we have over our lives and over the future. We worry because we don't know what the future holds with any certainty. And this isn't just my idea. Uh, the Bible says exactly the same thing. The cause of worry in our lives is that we put our trust in things that are inherently untrustable. They can't be trusted. We don't put our confidence in things that are certain. So I'd like us now to go through a selection of verses just to show this idea. Uh, and I've got four examples for us to consider. So the first one then is taken from Ecclesiastes in chapter 1. Uh, and these are the words of King Solomon of Israel which he, he wrote when he set out to find the meaning behind life and, and how to get satisfaction from it. In verse 12, he says this. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And skipping down to verse 17. And I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. But I perceived that this also is grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. 
So the Bible tells us that we can't put our trust in knowledge or in science either, I suppose, the quest for knowledge. The more that we learn, the more we discover about the world, the more that we realise we don't actually know. That most knowledge can actually only bring about more sorrow or, or more worry. It's the more complexity we find, the more uncontrollable and the more unpredictable the world seems, the more we worry, in short. So the next example is taken from First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this world, in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so we can't put our trust in money or in possessions either. Riches are uncertain and they're unpredictable. They could be here today, but then gone tomorrow. In fact, they may never come at all. Uh, and Jesus tells us exactly the same thing. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, because that is where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Riches are no basis for our confidence or for our hope. Another one then from Psalm 146 and, and verse 3. God says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that very day his plans perish. And so the Bible tells us too that we can't fully trust in men and women either. Not even kings or politicians or world leaders. Now they themselves don't hold full power over the future. Even their best laid plans can come to nothing if God so chooses. And then our final example uh, from Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And so then we learn too from the Bible that we shouldn't even trust in our own understanding or in our own endeavours to secure our futures. It, it may seem that we have the most control over our own lives, but none of us has complete control, do we? So then, knowledge, riches, other people, our own selves. The Bible teaches that all of these things are fallible and uncertain, and none of them can solve the problem of worry. But did you notice that those verses did tell us that there is something we can rely on? And despite all of those things that we can't put our trust in, um, despite all of those things that can't alleviate our worries, uh, and in some cases can only make our worries worse, in fact, there is somebody in whom we can put all of our trust and all of our confidence. We can't put our trust in the world, but we can put our confidence in God. And so the Bible teaches that the very simple reason why people worry is because they don't, uh, they don't trust in God. Their lives lack faith. And this is a, a very important Bible principle. And it's really, I think, the key message I'd like to get across this afternoon. That worry is caused by a lack of faith in God. But then again, at the same time, the antidote to worry is faith. Now, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells his disciples a parable. And we won't go into the details of the parable itself. Uh, but the message behind the parable is important. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, we read this. Then Jesus spake a parable to them, that men, ought, men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And then he goes on to tell the story of a persistent widow who's dogged determination really allows her to get justice from an unfair judge so men ought to pray and not to lose heart that's what jesus tells us so what he's really saying is that prayer to god is actually the antidote to worry praying is what prevents us from worrying in the first place and from becoming faint-hearted but then the opposite is also true neglecting to pray to god leads us to lose heart and causes us to fall into worry so let's think a little deeper about that thought then to be able to pray to god 
we firstly need to have faith and belief in him don't we it's as much as obvious we, we wouldn't be praying to god if we didn't believe he could hear us but that belief needs to go further than that doesn't it we also need to have a relationship with god it, it goes without saying that for effective communication with someone we need to build up a good relationship with them first and, and so the same is true with almighty god we need to build up a strong personal relationship with him uh, and pray to him daily to allow this to happen and this simple act of faith and prayer in our lives will help us to prevent worry but i guess we could then ask why does faith stop us from worrying about the future well first of all having faith in god gives us hope uh, it makes us safe in the comforting knowledge that god is in control of the world and that he's in control of our own lives that he has a plan for you and for me and although the future is out of our control we know that it is in god's infallible control we can trust him completely right now why well first of all because the bible tells us what god is like uh, he's all powerful he's all knowing he's all present he has the power to do anything he's in control of the whole world and it also tells us that if we have faith in him we can see him at work in our own lives too through our past experiences um, i know for certain that god has been at work in my own life as, as i look back on it and the more that we see god do for us the more our confidence in him can grow and hopefully the less we can worry we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are the called according to his purpose words there from romans chapter 8 so let's go on to ask the question what does god actually think about worry well god says that worry is a problem um, john 1 john 4 we read there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love there is no fear in love god says we should not be fearful fearful at all if we love god perfectly but is god asking the impossible is he asking too much of us i mean how can god possibly tell us that worrying is wrong if it's only the natural thing to do right well it all comes down to what god has done for us he's told us about the future through prophecies in the bible he's given us the opportunity to be saved from our sins uh, through the sacrifice of his son the lord jesus and he's also promised to look after us every day and to always provide for all of our needs i suppose to turn what we've been saying on its head if we knew what the future held and if we knew that everything would always turn out all right in the end then we would never have any need to worry would we well if we read our bibles we do know what the future holds if we read our bibles we do know that everything will turn out all right and so god says that worry is wrong because it betrays our lack of faith but thankfully for us god sees our imperfect love and his wonderful mercy can count our faith for righteousness he can count our weak love for him as if it were perfect and forgive us for our worries therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for after all these things the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day is its own trouble powerful words there from matthew chapter 6 and so the bible tells us that god has a plan for the future a plan for us on a perfect personal level but if we have faith in him and put him first in our own lives he'll care for us he'll provide for all of our needs and guide our lives but god doesn't just have a plan for us he's got a plan for the whole world too a plan on a worldwide level 
uh, and most of this plan has actually been fulfilled already so we can trust that the rest will be too we can trust in God's plan for the future with complete certainty because of what he's done in the past it's a subject for another time really but the Bible is full of prophecies that have been accurately fulfilled and that leads us nicely back onto a point we considered right at the beginning that people now seem to be more anxious than ever before well you may be surprised to hear this but the Bible actually predicted this thousands of years ago and Jesus under inspiration from God told us that a time would come when worry would intensify in our own time in fact now I don't know about you but I think that's really quite amazing let's just look at a little bit deeper into this by going back to our introductory reading at Luke chapter 21 where we read about the Olivet prophecy so what does this remarkable prophecy predict well there's so much to unpick in the whole chapter but I'd like us just to focus on verses 24 to 28 really now the first section of the prophecy uh, was actually fulfilled in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans but then when we come to verse 24 the prophecy pauses uh, and in fact there's a very long period of time between this verse and the next Jesus says in verse 24 that Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled prophecy would stop and not continue until those times have been fulfilled the times of the gentiles but what are these times of the gentiles when is this well i believe verse 29 has the answer jesus says look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding you, you see and know for yourselves that summer is near so you also when you see these things happening know that the kingdom of God is near now we don't really have time to go into the details now but the Bible repeatedly uses the fig tree uh, as a symbol for the nation of Israel when predicting that Israel would be taken into captivity uh, and that they would lose their homeland the prophet Joel uses the picture of a fig tree being stripped bare of all its bark and all its fruit and then being cast away and so I think we can safely conclude that the opposite, this picture that we have here in Luke 21 of that same fig tree beginning to blossom, returning to life, that that must be referring to the nation of Israel being reborn. It is people returning there, becoming fruitful once again. And now, remarkably, despite all odds against this happening, I suppose, um, this, this actually did begin to happen 2,000 years later in 1948 when the modern state of Israel was established. And then in 1967, East Jerusalem passed back from Gentile control into Israelite control. The times of the Gentiles started to be fulfilled 50, 60, 70 years ago. And therefore, we have to conclude that the rest of Jesus' prophecy is referring to our own days Verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. And so Jesus talks about the world being in turmoil in those last days, momentous events happening, nations in distress, people completely perplexed and bewildered not knowing what to do or where to turn men's hearts failing them for fear because of the expectation of that which is coming upon the earth war terrorism financial crises political upheaval the destruction of the earth's climate this is our time isn't it and so it's with good reason then that people worry about the future god prophesied that it would happen all those years ago but what will the end of all this be? What will be the conclusion? Well, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us that after these things happen, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now, that time isn't yet here. The world will 
continue to get worse worry will continue to increase there will be a time of trouble such as never was but God tells us that we don't actually have to fear that time worrying though that sounds because Luke 21 continues in verse 27 then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory now when these things begin to happen look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near and so God tells us that his plan will culminate in the return of the Lord Jesus to the earth to set up his kingdom we read in Revelation 21 that this will be a perfect time of peace and righteousness a time when the world will be free from all of the things that are wrong with it at the moment and that includes worry verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 21 God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away sounds wonderful doesn't it but what do we need to do to have a place in this kingdom in God's perfect kingdom that the Bible says will last forever well first of all we need to let go of our worries and fears hard though that is to do we need to trust in God we need to accept that he is in control and we need to believe that everything will work out for good if we have our faith completely in him perfect love casts out fear as we read earlier and as well as this we also need to learn about God and to choose to follow him every day now the first step along this path is to repent of our past sins those things that we've done wrong in the sight of God in the past and we need to be baptized as a sign of this repentance and as a sign of our commitment to God now we thought about last about baptism last week didn't we and how important it is for our salvation and then finally after we've been baptized we must prepare we must prepare for the certainty yes the certainty of Jesus's return and so if we have confidence in God and his care for us if we know where this world is heading if we have the hope of God's perfect kingdom then there's no more need to worry about the future in the words of Luke chapter 12 and verse 32 do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.